Hello and welcome back to The Real Hustler. My name is James and in today's show we're going to be talking about the history of the web part two. In the first part we're going to be going through know your history and the doubters. Now if you think about to your parents and yes, your parents, those people who were super dismissive of anything new that came in, such as even the internet. Now, there were plenty of people who dismissed the internet when it first came about. It's hard to think about that now, when it's an obvious thing that we use the internet for everything. Like, people are consumed literally by the internet because the first thing most people do when they get out of bed is reach for their phone. And what's on their phone? Well, generally most people have smartphones this day and age, so that generally means that they'll be looking at the internet the first thing they'll do. Now, if you think about that years ago, we didn't have mobile phones that had the internet on, never mind have the internet. So technology is moving on all the time. And what that really means is sometimes our parents and ourselves get caught up in what we're used to because generally as humans we don't like change but don't be like your parents that's the real point because your parents dismissed maybe the internet even though these days we use the internet for everything from literally shopping online through to communicating with our friends and family it doesn't matter the distance remember years ago you may not have even had friends in another country now it's almost a given that you have friends internationally across the whole world. Now history itself tells us that there's patterns, patterns of play of how things generally play out. If you think back to decades ago when cars didn't exist for instance and you just had a horse, now you'd have to be pretty lucky to have a horse back then because horses weren't necessarily something that every family would have. If you were lucky enough, you might have a horse and cart that would allow you to get your stuff around. But generally, people didn't even have that. Now we have cars and that's a forgiven. But back then, people were very dismissive of a car. They would say, why would I want a car? I can have a horse. My horse is part of my family. My car is never going to be part of my family. Yet these days, people even name their cars. Personally, I don't name my car, but plenty of people out there do. And, and that's the point. Years ago, they did. On top of the car, we have the transition from when we went from radio to TV. Now you only have to do a quick search on Google to find out what that went because there were plenty of people also who dismissed the TV. And then you have things like magazines, like magazines and newspapers. Can, people were actually consuming their information from around the world via their local newspapers. Now, if you think about that, that's quite out of date because by the time it gets to press and it actually gets out, that information became stale quite easily. Not only was it the fact that your journalist would actually be able to get that information in a timely manner, but also then being able to publish that would take time. These days, you can literally go from finding out the information to publishing it on the internet within seconds, taking out all of that time to actually publish the material. Art actually dates back to prehistoric periods. If you think about the ancient caveman, they would put their art on walls in the likes of Africa and some other places around the world where old pictures would have shown cavemen with big like spear sticks and stuff trying to slay their animals of that time. But the whole part of art itself dates back from the very start of man. People still actually felt that art belonged on walls. So you can think when canvas first came about there was a lot of resistance there. People were like, well, why would I put my art on a canvas? It could get damaged. But there are always benefits. And when these benefits start to outweigh those negatives, then people start to adopt it, especially when it becomes at a consumer level where people can consume it a lot easier. It means that not only does it not depreciate because it doesn't weather, because it's generally protected inside a building, it also means that people can actually transport that piece of art all around the world. So there was a number of reasons probably why it became adopted because people start to see the benefits of being a have it on a canvas rather than actually being stuck on a wall. And then back then, people always turned around and said, it's never gonna take off. <laughs> well, those same people who said that it would never take off are the same people that actually turned around and said, damn, I wish I got in there sooner. 
Now, that brings me on to something else that's very similar to that, but is in Web 3.0, and that's the non-fungible token. Now, these are actually digital forms of art because what they allow us to do is they allow us to put a digital form, an asset that you can own online and have a transparent ledger that shows whoever has owned that piece of art in the past. Now, not only that piece of art, but any piece of art that's done within that actual blockchain. And within that blockchain, which sits within the network, means that now people can actually see the genuine owner of it and also be able to determine whether or not it's a genuine piece. How do you actually know whether it's the original? Well, you could go speak to a painting expert who will verify whether or not it's a genuine piece. And sometimes there's still arguments on whether or not certain pieces that were lost over time but then resurface, whether or not they're actually the genuine pieces or not. And then you'll bring in experts to try and determine whether or not it is. But still, it does always leave the question mark open. However, when we come to there is no question mark there, you can see the full owner, who's the current owner, who's the past owner, and also see whether or not it's obviously genuine to start with. So that's one of the big advantages with things like N that provide us that full open transparency, but also that secure mechanism. And this is why people are getting so excited with this because of it showing the ability for it to not only provide a mechanism for us to now own digital assets online, but also gives us that authenticity and the secureness of it that lets us know that it's actually an original piece and not just like something that someone's copied and then actually made out that it's the original. We'll know straight away whether or not it is simply by looking at the blockchain. This brings us to the final section, the section on what I call the great disruption of the web. Why do I call it that? If we look at currently how the internet is formed, it's formed off a lot of big corporations and enterprises. These organizations can be anything from the likes of Facebook, Google, Amazon, Airbnb, even the likes of Uber. Now these organizations are centralized organizations. And when I say centralized, what I mean is that in technology terms, they are based on having central locations for databases. Databases are essentially the data that holds all of the information online. And what that means is these organizations essentially control everything, like a custodian who looks after everything in a centralized location, from the privacy settings through to the security, even whether or not you can access stuff, whether you can't access stuff. When we decentralize these onto a globally distributed network of computers, enabled by the blockchain, to collaborate on maintaining a public database. Now this leads us on to smart contracts and this is where things really get interesting because the smart contracts enable us to automate certain parts. This means that we can have services that are set up with set rules that allow us to automate processes. Now, if you work in management, you'll understand why I say when I say processes, but if you don't work in management, Take for instance something like a vending machine. Now a vending machine has a set program that allows you to put some money in, press a couple of buttons, and based on those buttons you get something back out. Now that is an automation because it's predefined how that machine's going to work. Now because you're putting in your money and then you're getting some goods back, you're doing an exchange of value if you like what you're hearing, please do subscribe to the channel and I'd love to be able to get your feedback. So leave some comments below and I will get back to you personally. Now, on to disintermediation. What is that term? Well, that really means what we're doing is taking the middle people out. If you remember rightly from one of my previous videos, when we even went to the internet, one of the things we did quite successfully was being able to drive down the cost value of goods that were being sold. But what I initially did on the internet was lower all the prices for things that you would generally buy on the actual high street. And now we have our secure networks. Now our secure networks are very much like the blockchains themselves because they are ecosystems in themselves, actual networks. And then those networks, you will maybe have actual monetary value that sits within that or a way of transacting that money. If you think of it, something along the lines of 
Bitcoin being one and Ethereum the other. And the differences between that are things like Bitcoin itself is version one of a blockchain. Ethereum is the next evolution, so it's referred to as 0.2 of, of a blockchain. That's because it has applications that now sit on top of the blockchain, allowing it to have additional things, such as the NFTs. Then there are version three of blockchain as well, and we'll go through these in a later video. One of the most interesting things about Web3 is the fact it has a number of technologies. Now, blockchain is one of them, but the other things are also things referred to as the Internet of Things, known as IoT. And the other thing we've also got as well is big data. What big data enables is much more advanced level of analytics. So if Web 1 was dumb, Web 2 was dynamic, what's Web 3? Web 3 will bring things alive, physical things alive. Because now what it enables is machine to machine communication. Think of your home your current home. Now, some people already have what they refer to as a smart home. It's not quite so smart yet, but it's certainly getting there. And more and more people are starting to realize that having something that you can literally remote on your mobile as you're out, such as having the right temperature when you first walk in, rather than being freezing cold if you've been away, having hot water and things like that, all of that could be controlled through your mobile. But where this blockchain will take it to the next level is everything will now be able to communicate with one another so rather than just relying on you setting those things from your mobile you could actually get all those devices to now to interconnect with each other that means they each communicate with each other so that if one thing happens it triggers one of the other smart devices in your home to react to that in order to be able to do something else for instance if I set off the heating and turned up the heating maybe the hot water would automatically come on as well because it would read how I normally respond to things. So what I could do on top of that, when I actually trigger my phone to say that I'm coming home, what now happens is because the smart home knows how I actually am in the home, I might get home, turn the kettle on, have a nice cup of tea first, half an hour later, get a shower, the smart home would now be able to actually send one signal back to the home to say, I'm on my way home. And all of a sudden your house knows your routine that we go through and will help set us up so that we're not having to do all these little small tasks that, yeah, we take for granted, but can actually make our lives easier. And this all interconnected network on what's referred to as IoT technology allows us to have that automation and again, going back to that automation where pre-programmed input to get an output means that we now have truly smart homes. Now, what does that actually all mean for, say, our economy? Well, that's interesting as well. We currently use something called GDP, the gross domestic product. And what that actually is, is it's a calculation based on the amount of goods we transact. Now, those original goods were thought to maybe go back to the earliest time where the transfer of goods may have been cattle and is based on the production of goods within a given area. GDP is made up from the centralization of mass production to create economies of scale. And all of this was done on closed networks. All of this was done in the capitalist economy. But what this now means is in Web3, we potentially can move away from that centralized network and now move towards a economy of services. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, it enables us to move away from the centralized to secure distributed networks. That enables people to have a method of trust in the exchanging of value on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. So in summary, the transition from Web 2 to Web 3 means that what centralized organizations enabled was trust, coordination, and cooperation within organizations. But what the blockchain will enable us is to trust the coordination cooperation between organizations and between individuals on a peer-to-peer -peer level. Please join me on the next show where we'll be looking into our first NFT and the background firstly of being able to purchase them but also exactly what it means to actually own an NFT and the actual marketplaces in which they are. Mm -hmm.